I was terrible at because I think that's like the qualify that like you have to suck when you get started on YouTube. It's almost like an initiation. Like you have to do all these death videos. One of the clients that I had at the time for freelance was like, we want to talk to the youth. Let's go to the MySpace and see how we can make that work. And that's like how I got my feet wet with it. And I started doing social media marketing work before social media was a thing. Like the first few years, I would say up until like 2011, 2012, people were like, huh? what why would i have someone do that and i'd have to have like the whole explanation and argument on top of that but like why their kid can't do it why like you should have an intern handling it and you know just having a lot of that like explanation and education i need a way to keep getting leads because if i leave the country like i can't go to networking events i can't go to sessions i can't speak like it just wasn't a big thing in like this 2015, 2016 era. And so I was like, okay, well, what can I do? This is me, Desiree Martinez. I make over $180,000 a year as a small creator. And I am also the host of the Funded YouTuber podcast. Today, we are flipping the script and I am in the hot seat today sharing my accidental creator journey. For 15 years, I have been in the content creation space, but found myself leaning into YouTube when the Air Force sent our family to the other side of the world. Since then, I have been playing the content creator dance, balancing motherhood, breadwinning, supporting my husband through his PTSD recovery and creating all of the things. In this episode, we break down how I got started way back in the MySpace days. Why moving across the globe kickstarted me onto YouTube, the shock of losing half of my clients 60 days before I had to replace all of my husband's income, what partnerships look like for me and how I get them, and how when it comes to income on YouTube, it can always be changing. My creator journey has been an adventure and I can't wait to walk you through it so that you can find your own way to becoming a full-time YouTuber. The Funded YouTuber is brought to you by Gigastar. I'm Sarah McNann, Chief Marketing Officer at Gigastar, and today we're going to flip the script and learn how creator ambassador and host of the Funded YouTuber podcast, Desiree Martinez, got her start as a creator. Welcome, Desiree, to your own show. Thanks. Thanks for having me on my show. I really appreciate that. It's super fun. I know that we're, we're doing this for lots of reasons, but I think that it's always valuable for like context and qualification for a host. Like, why why do you get to leave the hot seat? And so I like this flipping the script idea. Yeah, I think the audience should get to know who you are and how you got your start. I know you have an illustrious career stemming over years of, of how you got your start starting out in social media. Maybe you can talk us through how you how you got on board this crazy train of creating. So the crazy YouTube train was a lot of pit stops along the way. So I got started in the creator space totally on accident. Like it was not intentional, even a little bit. So I got started in the social media space creating content in like 2009. And I would like make MySpace pages for apartment communities. One of the clients that I had at the time for freelance was like, we want to talk to the youth. Let's go to the MySpace and see how we can make that work. And that's like how I got my feet wet with it. And I started doing social media marketing work before social media was a thing. Like the first few years, I would say up until like 2011, 2012, people were like, what? Why would I have someone do that? And I'd have to have like the whole explanation and argument on top of that, but like why their kid can't do it. Why like you should have an intern handling it and, you know, just having a lot of that like explanation education. And at the time too, there was so much exploding in the social space. Facebook like skyrocketed, MySpace went away, Twitter took over. We had a lot of like apps come into this space that were really fun, like Foursquare and all that stuff. But YouTube was like this random place on the internet that people kind of dabbled in. There was a lot of skit content. There was a lot of talking content. There's a lot of like people would get started with like the actual digital camera phones not like like using your smartphone it was like i have this camera i used to take pictures on my like family vacation i'm just gonna turn it around and like record it like it was raw and rough and like like super handy kind of thing and at the time i wasn't paying any attention to it and i didn't even consume youtube in like like for a casual space like my whole life revolved around like facebook and twitter and pinterest and stuff and as life happens, like you continue to grow and change as a person, that's like things happen in your life. Like when I got started, I was like 23 years old, 24. And then, you know, that's where like I got married. My husband and I went into the Air Force. We had children. And 
with the lifestyle that we had had where I continued to do social media marketing and management work, my life required me to get onto YouTube. So my husband, we got in orders to move to Korea. We were stationed in Texas and we moved to Korea. And my agency at the time was about a year old. I was doing a lot of freelance and I, and I decided to like start an agency to put military spouses to work to support my military community. And I'm like, I need a way to keep getting leads. Because if I leave the country, I, I can't go to networking events. I can't go to sessions. I can't speak. Like it just wasn't a big thing in like this 2015, 2016 era. And so I was like, okay, well, what can I do? And at the same time that my husband got orders, I, I was introduced to this fantastic creator. And her name is Amy Landino. She's now been married. So she's Amy Schmidt Power now. And she wrote a book called Vlog Like a Boss. And I was like, what is this? What is this like vlogging thing? And of course, it was also from a woman, which I was really intrigued by so much of like my YouTube knowledge experience with all these men doing things. And so I read her book and it was literally like my Bible. It was my how to step by step guide, like what I could do to make use YouTube very specifically to support a business. It wasn't about like how to be like a lifestyle creator or an entertainer. And they're like, hey, this is this is how you use this as a business tool. And I was like, this is my answer. And so when we got to Korea, I decided to launch my YouTube channel. So I, I spent the summer like batching and like figuring out what this was. I was got an eye on Fiverr and I found someone to help with some like really simple editing stuff. And I just, I went in all in in August of 2017. And I did this thing that was called beta vlog every day in August. And so I made like a video every single day in August just to like get my feet wet and give myself the exercise of showing up and creating content and experimenting with titles and thumbnails and, and doing all this stuff. And I, I ended up really loving it. I was terrible at it because I think that's like the qualify that you have to suck when you get started on YouTube. Like I think it's like a, it's almost like an initiation. Like you have to do all these videos. My first video, and I'm gonna put it up on screen. I have like so much makeup. I've like like the, turned like the dark eye, and I have my hair back, and I'm wearing a tank top. You can see my bra, and I'm using like my 720p webcam. This is what I had at the time. The more you watch the video, you notice I just start to sweat more and more profusely because my house in Korea didn't have air conditioning that like went through the whole house. So the room filled and I was just like sweating in like 100% humidity, 90 up there in Korea. And I was just like, I gotta make this work. And then like I would do silly things like pop with my hands, I'd hit the desk and the webcam would bounce because I just had it on the laptop. It was so bad. It is so bad. But it was part of, I think, like my initiation of like jumping into the deep end and figuring like, how do I make this work? And I really liked it. And I figured out like what to do. And I just kept showing up. And I had a really specific agenda that was attached to it, which is like, okay, I'm going to do this. And I need to make sure that I have a way to like communicate with this audience beyond YouTube. And about, I'm going to say a few months into it, I started collecting emails from people because I was like, these people could be clients someday. Like I'm not focused on getting leads yet. I just want to like really build the audience and the attention and get better at this. But eventually these people are watching these videos. They're going to need my help. And so I just started collecting emails and think probably about a year in, I was like, okay, time to talk to you guys every single week and do stuff. But I was still getting leads for the business and it worked really well. And I just... I really enjoyed the process of creating and how connecting worked and how it became this pillar for my business going forward. That's awesome. That's really great. Yeah. And I, I think everybody who has ever filmed and put a video on YouTube at any point in time has had that cringe moment of like looking back to the first ones, you know, it, it only creates kind of that benchmark for how far that they've come, right? So you can appreciate how far you've come and how far you've grown and what you've learned. And just looking back at those those early days, I mean, I know that I've put videos on YouTube during like grad school and I look back and I'm just like, oh gosh, I did so many things wrong. So many things, but that's okay. It's how we learn and grow, right? But you always did the right thing by just putting something up. Like that's... That's always the right thing. And it's an act of courage, right? It's a, it takes vulnerability to put yourself out there to the world, you know, and potentially to criti open yourself up to criticism. And it's it's super personal. It's a super personal thing. So, yeah. Couldn't agree more. So, Des, tell me, what was your first taste of income entering into these waters as a, as a creator? So, the thing that makes me a million is I was a business owner who was using YouTube as a way 
to continue to grow my business. It wasn't a thing that was like an, I wasn't actively thinking like, okay, like I'm going to become a YouTuber from this. It was never part of it. It was this thing I did to small my, my business, just like having a website or, you know, going to events or speaking and all these things I had done for years beforehand. So I was already making a solid income through my agency services that I was doing. But when we want to talk about like, okay, when did income start coming like directly from like YouTube things? I are you besides AdSense? I think it honestly it's gonna be a few it's a few years. I did a series on my YouTube channel in 2019, like the end of 2019. It was all about live streaming. And it was like how to live stream, like how it worked. Because it was like it was getting really popular at the time. It was starting to take the attraction. I was like, okay, this is like a social thing. You got to talk about like how to live stream on Facebook and how to live stream on YouTube. And, and I dove into like how different tools would work. And I did a video about how to go live with StreamYard. And I walked through the process and how it would go. And so this was, I want to say this, this had to be in like November, December, 2019. Well, it had a slow, steady growth. Like as far as like videos go in that time, it was very successful because it, it didn't like pop off, but it had a lot of like, you can see like the growth chart across the couple months that it was going really well. Okay, this is like a good topic for the channel. Then COVID hit and this magic weird thing had happened. I had at the time the only training video about how to use StreamYard on YouTube. Even StreamYard didn't have that at the time. Wow. Because at the time in StreamYard, when COVID happened and, and StreamYard, all of the other live streaming platforms really got a lot of attention. Like StreamYard basically really had a very small team. It was like the founders and a couple like tech, tech support people. Like they were not anything like what they are now. And so I, and they, and I want to say like a month or two beforehand, I had signed up for their affiliate program. And so I had that on that video. And so I was like, okay. I'm doing the thing. And so I did this very elaborate business thing that I attached to it. So I, of course, I got the affiliate commissions. But what I was noticing is that people that were watching my stream my video, which which skyrocketed, I had hundreds of thousands of views within like a couple of weeks because I was trying to figure out how to use it. People already had spot, had already purchased StreamYard, but they hadn't, they didn't know how to use it because there wasn't like a tutorial anywhere for it. So I hadn't. So about a month into COVID, I want to say the beginning of May, I did a series like seven videos for that. And it was really specific topics, like how to do these individual things on StreamYard that people were trying to figure out. And the number one thing that everyone wanted to do with StreamYard was do overlays. That's actually how I got into StreamYard because I have an art artist background, like my, my bachelor's degree is in multimedia art. And I wanted to have a really nice produced live stream because I want like the nice graphics. I wanted like the news style bottom thirds and things like that. And StreamYard allowed for me to do the custom graphics for that. And so what I did is I, with that series, I made and gave away a whole overlay set. I did them in like three colors and I did them for every layout. So one person, two people, three people, four people, right? On that series. And I would say in the matter of two months, I had over 6,500 people on an email list just for that. And so what I did with that is I went and I talked to Gage, who was the CEO. And I was like, hey, Gage, we need to have a conversation. And I told I told him, this is what my views are on my videos. This is like what my email list is based on this like specific thing. I want to be your sponsorship. Like, I want to be your person. I want to be like your first ambassador. I want to be the person that you pay every month to create content about StreamYard and solve the problems that people are having. And he was like, done, like, obviously. And so to this day, and we're recording this in end of May of 2024, I am still one of their paid sponsors for that, for that thing. Just because I made a video, it blew up, I doubled down on a series, I created something people needed, and I was able to convert it into something helpful that I could then go with the data, with the receipts to them to be like, we should work together. And it's been a fantastic friendship and it's a fantastic relationship, even through all their growth and their sales and all of the things like they continue to be a fantastic product that I love to continue to support. And we've done a lot of work together. So that was probably my first like YouTube specific like income thing. That's awesome. I, I love that. And I love that you reached out to the to the CEO because you you saw an opportunity for them to improve too by working together with yeah, they didn't they didn't have anything in place because they're engineers like engineers are fantastically smart people. They're not great. Generally, it's a super generalization, but I have worked with a lot of SaaS companies. They're not great at marketing and like being in front of people. 
And that's why they, all of them usually end up selling their companies because then they're like, I can do what I do great. And you guys can do what you do great to, to be successful. And they were growing and learning how to do things at the same time. I just had, could do that marketing arm for them because it's what I've been doing at that time for 10 years. So, and at this time, were you full time in your business? You know, what, what were the circumstances that maybe then allowed you to springboard from that experience and create income streams so that you could do all the things you wanted to do full time? I got it thrown into the deep end of, of full, of full time. So while I was in Korea, one of the things that had happened when we went to Korea is my husband had done an deployment and it was not well for him because, and, and he was starting to have what we now know were the early signs of PTSD. And we weren't familiar with it. We didn't know what we were looking for. We didn't know anybody who had gone through this and stuff. So for us, it was like, how can we just, maybe it's just this place that isn't working and we don't like it. So we have, we as a family volunteered to go to Korea to see if like a change of base and judiciation would help us. And that wasn't so working. And so while we were having the time, we had been in the Air Force about three years at that point. And we thought that we were going to go the full, there's a, this term, it's called no career. It's when you do 20 years of, of active duty service. And then you get like a lot of benefits for it. We decided that we weren't going to be able to do that. And my husband was like, I need you to grow this business to replace my income. And I was like, okay, like it makes a lot of sense. Like this is a sound argument. And so I worked I use the agent. I use YouTube. I use the agency and networking and all of the marketing things to get us there. And my husband was set to separate from the Air Force in November of 2019. And what was a real big hiccup in the journey is in August of 2019, I lost like 50% of my clients for no reason. We weren't doing a bad job or anything. things. So there's like a there's a social like a platform shift. And so it was like, I had to completely reevaluate how my business was structured and how I made money and where things were. And literally just in the nick of time, when he got out, I was able to really, I had met the required goal that we needed to replace his income so that we could continue to support our family. Like, you know, we're a family of four, we have two kids, you know, we have dogs and stuff and we had to like be aware of everybody. So there's a lot of like that kind of pressure. To, to make sure that it worked. And then when COVID hit, the business completely revamped that the streamer stuff and creator stuff really showed me like, okay, there's other ways to do this. And I had already been laying that groundwork. And I just like dove in full force into it. And now YouTube and being a creator is the driving force of my income, but I still have the agency piece. It's in the, I'm like doing a whole like rebranding, restructuring thing of it, but it's still, I still love that I get to create every day. That's awesome. Was that drop in your clients that happened right before everything, was that the worst kind of experience that you've had in terms of like income scare, horrible money experience? Or have there been things in the meantime that have happened? That one was really scary because we were on the precipice of not having our safety net of my husband's income. Like when you are a dual income family and you're in that transition and like something it comes in and change it it's really hard like there were like conversations like I was doing like okay I guess I need to get a job like I updated my resume and my LinkedIn I did interviews like and it was just one of those like gut-wrenching experiences like to have that like you know when you are an entrepreneur for so long and and a creator in a way like you have so much control of your life and all the things that are going on it's hard to like think about giving that up and so that was really tough. And I was obviously able to find my way into making it work. Okay, what, okay. so here's a story of how I fix this. It. It's kind of funny, actually. So I went to an event in Texas called Video Marketing World. I'm a huge, my biggest soapbox about like business and network and working is you got to go network. You got to go to stuff. Now, I love like my little like joke. I say like I'm an introvert or I'm an extrovert. Who works in our basement in the middle of the country so i need the people like it's how i get my people in but in all honesty like it's where i'm able to build relationships it's so hard to like track people online in the same way that you can when you're in person with somebody i don't know why it's so much more intimate but it just really helps and while i was at this event i was i ran into a bunch of really cool women who were speaking i interviewed them for a podcast i have called the woman of the video and i got to talk to this woman her name was Devin. she was the ceo of brailleski and Braille skateboarding is the largest artist skateboarding YouTube channel on YouTube right now. And they were in this thing. She had put a challenge out from the stage 
that was if anyone has any ideas how to crack Facebook, come find me. And I was like, hold, hold my pen. I've got this. Like I told, because like Facebook is a platform I've understood even to say very well, like how to make it work well. And I went to her, I told her my idea. I was like, hey, I have like three ideas about what we can do to help with Facebook. And I told her them and she's like, can I hire you? I was like, hundred percent. And so by doing the in-person event, I was able to pick up the contract work with them, which allowed for us to have that little bit of safety net so that we could move forward and recollect our clients and, and get new ones and stuff like that. And I had it like fixed by the end of 2019, but it was like that saving grace moment for me. So it's like, it was this horrible thing. I was able to find being the right place, the right time, have the right creative solution and the gumption to go talk to her after I interviewed her for my podcast with that. And it just worked out really great. And she's actually, she and I are still friends today. So it's just one of those things where it was something bad that turned into something good. I've got a lot of bad money stories because it's just the creator world's a mess sometimes. And it can be a little against your will. Yeah, I don't know that we've ever talked to a creator who's not had one of those bad experiences or bad money stories. But I think it's great that you you went after, you know, you have, again, you're presenting a solution to somebody who's in need of a solution, offering your services, you know, saying, I can help you with this. And you're really creating a case for yourself to move yourself forward. And help them. I don't know. I assume it's not afraid of the rejection or what, but I just like, I get ideas. I just want to share them and see them done. And it tends to convert into opportunities for income for me. And I I know it's very fortunate and it's a weird gift that I have, but I'm grateful that I have it. So what would you say your most successful financial moment in your career? What would you cite that as? I really do like my she nerd story. I think that that's one of my favorites. But I think, you know, some of the other ones that I've been able to do that I've really enjoyed is being able to tap into stuff beforehand. So in 2022... I decided, 2022, I decided that I was going to explore the Amazon Influencer Program. And at the time, it was very new still. So there's the, there's the Amazon Associates Program that everybody's familiar with, where you can sign up, you use links, and you get commissions when people buy stuff with your links. The Influencer Program is where you create content, simple videos about products, and then you upload them to the platform and Amazon puts them on the products page. And then when someone watches your video and decides, you know what, this video helped me make this purchasing decision and you go buy it and then you get commissions from it. And I just went all in on it because I had just moved to our house that we live in now in Michigan and Amazon and me, we have been friends for a hot minute. I'm like, I have been an Amazon Prime member since 2003 when I went to college. You, can, you got it free to get books. We're friends. We're tight. We have been hanging out together for a long minute. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, let's do it. So like my house is just all Amazon stuff. Like you take aside the studio equipment. Like it's like everything that you can and everything that even you buy at the store and stuff, like you can get on Amazon. And so I just started making videos about them. It wasn't about my brand. It wasn't about like anything related to what I did. It was just me holding my phone in front of it and talking about it. And I was able to get to a point with my Amazon stuff where I was making like $5,000 a month. And it was incredible. It was incredibly lucrative. And there are some people that are out there that still have found a way to make that much money from it. For me, it, it's down to a point where it's only like 600 bucks a month that I'm making off it. But I'm also not putting in the work for it. Like I'm not doing it anymore just because the priority of where I want to spend my time and what I wanted to do to make money shifted. But it is this passive income stream. But that to me was one of those like incredible ones. Like I made $47,000 that year from Amazon like influencer from making stuff, making videos about stuff I already had bought in my house. And so it was a really great exploration thing. It really taught me like test out things that can work for you if they seem like something you can reasonably do. But she wants to like test it and be like, yes. And then you can just dive in. It was a really great opportunity for me. But what it always cracks up has nothing to do with what I do. Like it's creating content. It has nothing to do with social media or online creator marketing, which is what I talk about all the time. Online. Right. It's adjacent. So let's talk about all of, you know, if we looked at the pie chart of your, your income stream and to go over the different areas of the chart where you would kind of break down your income, let's have a look at that. The biggest chunk of your pie is from spokesperson and user generated content. Yes. So that's actually an interesting one because that's what it has turned into in this year. The work I do with the creating for other brands as part of, of that. So like, you know, what we what I get to do with Gigastar 
that's kind of falls into that category, creating content for other brands or other products. I really just like to create content. And I know that people are like, I got to own it all. It's got to be like under my name and all this other stuff. But I'm done. I do that still, but I feel like I have, I have more to give and more to reach and more ways to support brands and businesses. So I like to create for them. And I, I have been on this soapbox of from the end of 2023 heading into 2024, where we're going to see a shift. We're seeing a shift. We're in the shift in the creator economy where brands are becoming creators rather than relying on other people to create. So they're hiring a lot of in-house talent and people to create for them, not just on like Instagram and TikTok, but also on YouTube as well, because creating on YouTube, it's its own unique and specific beast, but it also has like the greatest impact and the longest, the most longevity for the content. And so getting to do that with other brands has been really fun. That's terrific. And it looks like as kind of, you know, the second biggest chunk of your income comes from from sponsorships. It does. Yeah. Like, again, it's always crazy. Like I started this journey when I was going through and I was looking, I was like, wow, it's interesting how much like it's all shifted around over the past couple of years. But yeah, it, it's with sponsorships. And again, I'm a small creator. Like if you go to my YouTube channel at this time, I have less than 40,000 subscribers, but I have really great relationships with brands where the content that I create supports them long term and helps them with brand authority then they also can use it as part of like what they're doing with their marketing to share to their audience that they don't have to always be creating new things and so that's a big part of like my sponsorship packages that i do so i get to work with like adobe i work with vidiq i work with Streamyard, and then i'll have some like onesie twosie brands like i recently did a video with sem rush they had launched like a creator pack of tools. And so like, I was like, that aligns with my audience and stuff. So I could like, it made sense to me to promote it there. They just wanted the video to saturate their market. And so like, okay, let's do that. Fantastic. And then of course, I mean, public speaking is such a strength of yours that, you know, the consulting and speaking part, uh, that doesn't surprise me as, as being a nice sizable chunk of your income. Yeah, again, when my shift into 2024, I, I reprioritize like how I'm positioning myself as in the creator economy, less like social media marketer and more creator economy strategist. And so like my mission within that is to help creators and brands navigate the creator economy so that they can make money. I have been so bullish in all of my creator education that I do about making money because I feel like there was a very large narrative for years where it was like, you should create content you love and the money will just come to you. And I'm like, then it's such bullshit. I'm like, no, like is that how businesses work? And I really am enjoying that right now. We're seeing a very sizable shift where it's like, we need to control our audiences. We can't like uh, control algorithms. We have to make sure that we're always evolving and changing and testing and like with all the things that are happening, like TikTok maybe going away and, you know, Facebook and Meta are having their whole journey and changing things. The AI has come in and like, there's all this. What's so funny to me though, is that like, you have like those sleeper platforms in the background that are just like, we're here, given to the creators, help you make money, like LinkedIn and Snapchat. And I'm just like, what the heck is going on? Like, so it's just, it's been, it's been all right. And so like helping brands and creators navigate it so that they know what they're doing so that they can put the right systems in place to get to what their bottom lines are and their goals are. It just gives them a lot of clarity because then I can not only consult with them and like, here's an, a plan and agenda or like a, a punch list for you to do. I also can help supply them with like the resuppliers and the right creators to help them and things like that. So it's been, it's been a real interesting and fun transition. That's great. I know you have, you have a lot of different slices of your pie here. I just want to ask for the, the last one I want to at, talk about is the fourth, your fourth largest and that's service. Tell me, what is that, in, what does that encompass? So for me, the services is in my agency. So it's in, we offer social media marketing and online marketing services to businesses. And a lot of times they're local, small businesses or like really random ones too. Because it's like, when we think about social media marketing, when we think about online marketing, a lot of our case studies and a lot of our things that we highlight or analyze are really big brands. And we just in a creator space too. Like I... I live and breathe for every episode of the Colin and Samir podcast. Every creator that comes on is huge. And I feel like it's like those are the outliers. Those are, those are the aspirational points. That's not where the vast majority of people are. Like, so like we're talking about business and online marketing. Everyone's always like, oh, the Starbucks, the Targets, the Elfs, the Pepsis, like, you know, of those of the world. When, when you look around, just like your own, like neighborhoods, you look on your own towns, like even the local chiropractor and the local lawyer and the local insurance guy. 
and even the local grocery store. Like they all need marketing help too. And so I'm able to, and because I've been doing this again, like I told you, 2009 with MySpace pages. You know, I still, we still do a great deal of work with them and we're able to, because I'm, we're up to date with like what's happening with modern practices for social creative ideas, tapping trends and stuff, we're able to do that work for them as well. And a big part of what I am shifting into in my later half of the year is rebranding the agency and offering more of like a higher package marketing service that has a creator first kind of focus. Because when I teach you, we'll talk about the consulting and speaking, like I teach businesses how to use YouTube as a pillar, as a foundation of their marketing, because they're able to use the content from YouTube and repurpose it down into really smart, effective ways so that they can simplify and streamline how their marketing works. And it keeps lasting for them. Like the problem with doing social, just social media strategies, you're always tracing, you're always having to create something. It's very exhausting. And so having a YouTube foundational strategy is has a lot more, has a lot more legs. It has a nice rooted sort of situation versus like, you know, the tumbleweeds of, of social is <laughs> a thing. So it's been great to build that out. And again, it's how I started in the creator spaces with service. I think something that you said really kind of it rings true. And that's, you know, when you have some creator outlets that only talk to the most successful YouTubers, the biggest while it's like, you're only hearing about the exceptions, the exceptional creators who've made it as opposed to like, everyday people, like people who are who are wanting to get the word out, who want to talk about their business, why talk about what content they're creating, how they're serving and solving problems to regular people, like in that, in the, the majority, the bulk majority of creators who might not be, you know, a Mr. Beast. So it's good to have those conversations about, you know, strategy and tactics and, and how people are able to do it full time and how to incrementally improve their lives and and get their solutions out there. So I think that's great. You know, as creators and people, that, that's one of the things I love about what we're doing with the Sunday YouTuber podcast. I love that it's not the, I mean, what I love this interview you with Dan is not about his money. Yes, because he probably know anything about his money. No, I'd have to talk to his CPA or whatever, his CMO or, what, or his CFO, right? But of course they would. It'd be an interesting look into like how someone is doing it. But I really like that we have also the smaller stories. We have the more like relatable stories. Like I have a hundred thousand subscribers and this is how I'm making a full-time income to live my life. And I think that that has a lot of power and a lot of like, that's, I think like the goal, like when you, when you talk to so many people about like why they become creators, it's usually, I had this idea. I wanted to create something really cool. And also I wanted it to be my job and the whole like casing of numbers, like hundred thousand subscribers, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it sounds great. But you know what? It sounds way better than 100,000 subscribers. $100,000. Like I would much rather $100,000 than 100,000 subscribers because I cannot pay my mortgage or take care of my family with 100,000 subscribers if that's like all I've been doing, like all I've been focusing on. And so I think that people need to know their different income options and the opportunities that they have to them. And that's what we explore every episode that we do. And that's why I'm really grateful I got to share like how I make money so people know that it's just it's another option for them as well. Yeah. And your journey is very unique. And I love that every guest that is on the Funding YouTuber podcast has a different purpose, has a different why, has a different story to share. And I think it's wonderful. I think we need to to tell more of those stories and not to be and to not be afraid to talk about you know, the worst thing that happens money-wise, my, my worst money decision in terms of being a creator, you know, those those are stories that need to be shared too because it could help, you know, another creator avoid that. It just helps the whole thing. Well, I love what we do, Sarah. I love what we do. I love what we do too. So what's your next money move? My next money move is continuing my creator economy strategy work and really enjoying it. I've had some missteps with our commitments and refiguring out like what my capabilities are and like where my sweet spot is with the work and also the restructuring and the rebranding of my business, my agency to explore how that can be successful. And I also can like super credit, like getting to see the behind the scenes, like how Gigan Star operates and stuff. It's been like able to like learn lessons and, and see what you guys have been doing so successfully so that I can take some of those things those those lessons and and apply them over to what i'm doing as well so i'm really looking forward to seeing like how that is going to to change like how my income looks like for next year as well but i will always i think create because i love i think if i had to pick my favorite kind of content created this podcasting because i love talking to people 
I love sharing stories and learning from people. So I think that no matter what, like if I got to pick the things I, I would do, if I got any paid you, it would probably be doing podcasting. We are so good at things. And as a teaser, you're going to be speaking at VidCon in Anaheim in June. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So I'm talking at VidCon at the time it's recording. We're in May. VidCon, I speak June 29th. And I'm talking about 12 unique ways you can make money as a small creator. And I, I actually did this presentation at VidCon in Baltimore in 2023, and it's a totally like updated, revamped version of that because there's always new ways and new things and new ideas. And I I just want everyone to get to be a creator because being creators is one of the coolest jobs in the world. Like my kids have like the best flex when they're like multi YouTuber. That everyone's always like, oh, that's so cool. My mom just you know does it like hey hey hey. But you know, it's super fun that I get to do this. So I'm looking forward to it. That's awesome. Well, Desiree, this was a fantastic conversation, a fantastic behind the scenes, flip the script episode to get to know who you are and your creator journey. I appreciate that. Remember, everything is over in the show notes at thefunnedyoutuber.com. And until next week, go make that money. The Funded YouTuber is brought to you by Gigastar, a parent company of Gigastar Market, an SEC registered funding portal and member of FINRA. Learn more at gigastar.io. Music provided by APM Music, unrivaled music to bring your stories to life. Neither Gigastar nor its affiliated companies provide legal, regulatory, financial, or tax advice. Any opinions expressed herein are those of the authors and are the informational purposes only. The information and opinions expressed herein are subject to change without notice and do not take into account the particular investments, objectives, financial situation, or needs of any specific investors.